tests on Monday. I always need a weekend to grade them. Did you burn mine, please? Yes! <laughs> I would love yeah. to! Is it, like, it for me. is it super kindling? Uh, that's what's going to be useful once yeah. I get it back. I just have to blow on it and it's going to erupt in flames. Exactly. All right, so I have everybody's module up here. All right, so today we get to do some cool stuff. We get to do integration where the domain is not just an interval. So we're going to, oh. You wish. Excellent. So the first topic is the double integral. Up to now, you've just done single integrals. And then in this class, we'll do doubles and then triples. And uh, let's kind of look at the easiest case or the most intuitive case for a double integral. The idea in the, what? Are you talking to me? No, oh, OK. Um, so in the simplest case, the idea is going to be that we're going to imagine a surface that's positive valued, so we have a surface floating above the xy plane. And just like with the one variable function, we found the area beneath the curve. We want to do the analogy here of finding the volume beneath the surface. Okay. So in one variable calc, when you first in, were first introduced to the integral, you assumed you had a positive valued function. And then you use the integral to find the area beneath that curve. So same idea here. We're going to assume we have a positive valued surface. And we're going to have a two-dimensional domain. And we're going to start out with the simplest possible domain in the xy plane. We're going to have a rectangle. All right. So conceptually, what we're thinking about is partitioning our rectangle into a bunch of little rectangles. So in Calc 1, you took your interval and you partitioned it into a bunch of subintervals. And then you created all those rectangles called the Riemann sum. And then you let n go to infinity to actually define the integral, the single integral. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're partitioning the domain, which is this rectangle, into these little tiny rectangles. and then. For one rectangle, we'll call it, say, the kth rectangle, we're picking a random point in there. Now, in Calc 1, what you did, the, the theory was that with your subintervals, you could pick a point anywhere. But in practice, in Calc 1, you either pick the right end point or the left end point or the midpoint. Those were three different types of Riemann sums that you did by hand. In this class, we're not going to do any Riemann sums by hand. Because there's an infinite number of choices you know, in this rectangle, and there's not one that would make more sense than any other. With intervals, it did make sense. You could have an upper limit, a lower limit, or, or whatever. You know, so you had different, different options there. Here, we don't have that. So we're picking our random point. We call it the star point. So x sub k star, y sub k star is just a random point in the kth, inter, in the kth uh, rectangle. And what we imagine is this parallel piping sitting above that rectangle. So instead of using a, a rectangle approximation to an area, we're going to use a parallel piping approximation to some volume that's got a curved cap. Right? So that parallel piping is going to approximate the volume below the surface there. So there's a little patch in the surface, right? And this is just going to approximate. It might be in a, a little bit above or a little bit below. We don't know. Right? But it's going to approximate it. And we're going to do the same thing that we did in Calc 1. We're going to let n go to infinity. We're going to let the number of subintervals in Calc 1, subrectangles here, we're going to let that go to infinity. So uh, we are going to call, before we go to the next slide, we're going to call this little area element, that little rectangle, so the kth rectangle, we're thinking about that as a delta a sub k. That's the area of the kth rectangle. And we can turn that into a delta x sub k times delta y sub k. 
the width of the kth rectangle is delta x sub k, and the height of the kth rectangle is delta y sub k. Right? So each one of those rectangles fits in this mold here, where you think of the area of the rectangle as change in x times change in y. So all the way through. <clears throat> Now, the volume of that parallel piping, or they're calling it a box. In old math books, you would never see the word box. <laughs> it could be called the parallel piping. So the volume of that box, of course, is the area of the base times the height. And the height is the function value at the star point. So you're picking your x sub k star, y sub k star. And that point that you pick, you're finding the function value, and that's going to be the height of that parallel piping. So the area of the kth box is the height multiplied by the area of the base. Right? And then what we're going to do, like we did in Calc 1, we're going to define the volume. So first we start without the limit. We say the volume's about the sum of all these parallel pipettes. The volume's about that. All right. So we're going to have our, our partition with n parallel pipettes. Here is the area of each, of each rectangle in the partition. Here's the height. So multiply those together, and you get the volume of the kth parallel pipe. Add them all up, close to the volume. And then we take the limit, and we get exactly the volume. So what we're going to do is define the double integral. And we're going to say the double integral of a function. So we're starting out, we're not dealing with surfaces that aren't functions right now. We're strictly dealing with functions. Just like in Calc 1, you dealt with functions, not relations. So we've got this two-variable integral with an area differential instead of a length differential. Area differential. That's going to be rewritten. That's going to be defined as exactly the limit as the norm of the partition goes to 0. So let's talk about what I mean by that briefly. When we talk about the norm of a partition, let's think about an interval for a minute from A to B. The simplest way to define a partition is to do a uniform partition. So that means every subinterval is the same width. But you don't have to. So you could partition this interval that I have on the board, A, B, like that. There's a partition. And when we say the norm of the partition is going to 0, and that's what this is saying here, that delta going to 0, delta going to 0 means the maximum, let's look at this interval case first, the largest of all these subintervals is going to 0. That's what that means. The norm of a partition is the width of the largest subinterval, if you're talking about intervals. It's the largest subarea if you're talking about rectangles. So they're saying the biggest of your uh, subintervals or subrectangles is going to zero. Right? And if that's happening, that means the number of rectangles is going to infinity. Calc 1, it meant the number of intervals is going to infinity. And the only way we can be sure about that equals is that both those things have to be happening. Right? We can't let the number of intervals go to infinity without the width of each subinterval going to zero, because then we're going to have we're going to have error then. We have to make sure that all subintervals are going to zero. So that's why we say that. Right, so it's, do you see that it's not exactly the same? If you let n go to infinity, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that the largest width is also going to zero. But if you enforce this, that the largest width is going to zero, that, nece that necessarily means that there's going to be an infinite number of, that n is going to infinity. So there's a slight difference. So here, when we say the partition is going to 0, it just means that every rectangle that we create in our partition, area is going to 0. Okay. Classic Riemann sum. Evaluating that by hand with a surface is virtually impossible. So we will never use that here. In Calc 1, the left, right, and midpoint approximations, you could do that pretty easily for a small partition. For volumes, it makes no sense to even think about it other than as a theor theoretical construction. So we have to figure out then, how the heck 
do we evaluate this double integral if we want to ignore this whole limit definition? And there is a great theorem by a guy with a great name, Fubini. And so Fubini uh, is the guy that developed this process here, turning a double integral into a sequence of single integrals. So according to Fubini, you can separate this double integral. So that double integral is representing the volume under the surface F. When you see this right here, that's what you want to be thinking. The, the easiest way to visualize a double integral, think of it as the volume below. You imagine a surface above the xy plane. You imagine a rectangle down in the xy plane. And the double integral of F over R means the volume beneath F on the rectangle R. So Fubini said you can actually integrate this as a sequence of single integrals. Why is that not working? Uh, oh, I wanted the rectangle, that's why. All right, so this is being separated into two integrals. There's an inner integral and an outer integral. Also notice that we're still dealing with a rectangle. We're going to change our region to be a little more complicated soon. But right now, we just have a rectangle. And when we read the limits here, we're saying to ourselves, OK, the, x, the dx is here. So the inner integral has limits from x equals a to x equals b. The outer integral has y limits from y equals c to y equals d. Right, so this always works with the rectangle. If your domain is a rectangle, you can do it in either way. You can have your order be dx and then dy, or you could have your order be dy and then dx. If it's a rectangle that you're integrating on, doesn't matter the order. No problem. And just notice that right, the y's are now on the inside over here, and the x's are now on the outside. OK, so Bubini takes a double and turns it into a sequence of, of uh, singles. Usually, what books will refer to this as, we'll call this integral an iterated integral. That's what they'll refer to that as, iterated integral, i.e. a sequence of two single integrals. All right, so that's the theory behind it. Now, let's try it. OK, so with this first one here, we're going to start with the inner integral. The inner integral is with respect to y. And so what we're going to do is think of x as constant, just like we did partial derivatives. So in some sense, this is like partially integrating. First, we're going to integrate with respect to y, and then we'll integrate with respect to x. OK? So the outer integral is going to remain the same. So we've got that. We have the dx out there. We're just treating the inside here. So with respect to y, so that's going to be 3x squared y. Because 3x squared is constant with respect to y. So we're integrating that constant. And then integrating this term with respect to y, we get y to the fourth divided by 4. The fourths cancel, so we get y to the fourth. And then we're still left with the dx out there. And now we have to evaluate the inner integral, the, the antiderivative, from 0 to 1. Let's go this way. OK, so the outer integral is still there. Inner integral, we've found, the ant we found an antiderivative. So we're going to plug in 1 and then plug in 0, take the difference, and we're plugging in for y. So when we plug in the 1, we get 3x squared plus 1. And then we have to subtract off what we get when we plug in y equals 0. If it helps, put the y here. If, it, if you're feeling like you're you know, 
if it's alphabet soup and you're not plugging it into the right letter, put your Ys there just to emphasize that that's the variable you're plugging in those constants for. So everybody agree that we perform the fundamental theorem properly? Fundamental theorem of calculus. Find an antiderivative, plug in your upper limit, plug in your lower limit, and take the difference. And now we're back to Calc 1. Now we just have a regular single integral. We're not holding anything constant. So we just integrate nice and cleanly. And that's from 1 to 2. So we'll end up with 10 minus 2. So we get 8. So assuming that the surface is positive valued on that rectangle, we have just found the volume beneath it. And if we look at this surface here, this function, do you agree that it's greater than or equal to 0 on this entire rectangle? Yeah. All right, so on that rectangle where x is going from 1 to 2 and y is going from 0 to 1, that function, that surface, it's above, so we're finding volume between the surface and the xy line. Bradley, your question? Um, pretty much it. Right? Oh, okay. Randy? Uh, I'm still missing a little bit about what's going on there. The first interval there, the 2 to 1, mm -hmm. um, that value The 1 to 2? Yes, yeah, 1 to 2. That one is used in the final part there? Yes, that's the outer integral. So the outer integral is with respect to x. So that's just sort of sitting and waiting for action. So what exactly do you do to get the first integral there to the second one? So when we integrate this, we're integrating this expression with respect to y. x is constant with respect to y. Sorry, I mean second to third. Oh, OK. Yeah. And so that's how we got that. And then so here to here? Yes. So now we plug y equals 1. So we're doing the fundamental theorem business where you plug in your upper limit. You get 3x squared plus 1, plug in 1 minus what you get when you plug in 0. Okay. Plug in 0 for y makes it all go away. It's like the opposite of partial integrals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Partial integrals, first with respect to one, then with respect to the other. Yeah, uh, Jackson? So you're, what you're doing is you're multiplying basically the integral along the x components of the function times the integral along the y, or like vice versa. Or so the inner integral right here, let me see if I can say this without too much confusion. So the inner integral here, right there, uh, when we come over to here, what that's giving us is a cross-sectional area at x. So when we get rid of the y, we're letting the y run. So let me draw a picture of our domain. And we can talk about the cross-sectional area. So the idea when we're finding the volume of a surface, volume beneath a surface, you can imagine all these cross-sectional areas, an infinite number of slices, and those are all in total giving you the volume. And that's what each one of these does. So like if I plug in x equals 2, I'll get the cross-sectional area where x is 2. When I plug in x equals 1, this will give me the cross-sectional area where x is 1. So when we look at our domain here, the y's are going from 0 to 1. The x's are going from 1 to 2. So our region right here, that's, that's our domain. And we're going to do. The, the, the y first. So the y is going from 0 to 1. And so we're imagining this element here. That element is going to slide across from x equals 1 to x equals 2. All right? And that function right there is going to tell us the area above that element. Right? So the surface is sitting on top here. And if you look at that element right there, that's creating an area slice. And the area slice will have a different area for each x value. So at x equals 1.25, if I plug 1.25 in there, I'll find the area beneath the surface and above that little element. All right, so we're essentially finding an area function and then integrating that to get the volume. 
So this guy right here is a cross-sectional area function. And then if we add up that infinite number of cross-sectional areas, we'll get a volume. Sense? Yeah. So we want to do the inside integral and then the outside one. Mm -hmm. What happens if you do it in the other, like if you do the outside one and the inside one? You think you get a different answer? I think so. You don't believe Fubini? Maybe not. Oh, yeah. Great. Never mind. How can you distrust Fubini? <laughs> Sorry, I believe you, Fubini. So Fubini takes offense because that's, <laughs> that's what his theorem says. His theorem says that you could do, if you have a rectangular area as your as your domain region, that you can integrate in either order. And you'll get the exact same answer. So if you switch the order here, it's probably a really good exercise. Let's do it. Because that's, it's, it's important to be convinced that that's true. And that's a really good question. So Fubini says that this should be true. So let's check. So if we go 0 to 1, and then 1 to 2, 3x squared plus 4y cubed. So we're switching our differentials then, and the inner integral is now with respect to x. So now, actually I want to put that as a different color, those brackets, just to, so here with respect to x, that's going to create a cross-sectional area function that's going to give us the area for any y value between 0 and 1, it's going to give us the area above that element. So now we're going to be adding up slices this direction of area, slices of area this way with respect to y instead of area slices with respect to x. So let's notice that we do get the same thing. <clears throat> so integrating the inside with respect to x. So that's going to give us x cubed over 3. Threes cancel. And now uh, 4y cubed with respect to x, that's constant, right? So we're going to get... 4y cubed x, that's going to go from 1 to 2. Then we still have our dy on the outside. So let's evaluate the inside. The outer integral is just sitting there. So we're now, again, if you are finding yourself not plugging the constants into the right letter, put the letter there just to, re -emphasize, just to emphasize. So plugging the 2 in, we get 8 plus 8y cubed. Now we plug in the x equals 1, and we have to subtract off what we get when we plug in x equals 1. So that'll be 1 plus 4y cubed. And then that's all uh, dy on the outside. All right, so let's just combine our like terms before we integrate. So we're going to get 4y cubed uh, plus 7. All right, so that function right there. So real quick, you said we can only use that when it's rectangular. How do we know it's rectangular? Uh, because the limits are constants, right? So this says y is one, 0 to 1. This says x is 1 to 2. So we can't use that theorem if it's not. So what we're going to see is if you change the boundaries, so the boundaries are curved instead of rectangular, then we have to do something a little different. With a, a rectangle, you can swap the integrals. If they're not rectangles, if you have some sort of curved boundary, you, then you have a specific order that you have to do it in. So we'll do that next. So that function right there, 4y cubed plus 7, for all of the y values between 1 and 2, that's going to give us the area this direction. So if I plug in y equals 0.5 into this function right here, 4y cubed plus 7, that tells me the area when y is 0.5. And x is run from 1 to 2. So it's going to give that cross-sectional area. And let's see, hopefully we end up with the right answer. We get y to the fourth plus 7y. That's from 0 to 1. That ends up being 8, which is the same as that. So yeah, rectangular area. Doesn't matter. Fubini. All right, so let's try another one. I'll go through one more. It takes a little bit to get used to doing these partial integrals. So the outer integral is the x. The inner integral 
is with respect to y. Okay, so that, the one thing that's odd is that you're doing this inner integral and you're ending up with a function. You're not ending up with a constant, right? So if we look at the first one up here, when we complete this inner integral, we end up with this function, 3x squared plus 1. So that's different than anything you've done in the past, because whenever you saw a definite integral, you, in your mind you thought, oh, it's a number. I should end up with a number. But now we're doing this you know, sort of partial integral, and we're ending up with a function. So that's a little different. So here, when we integrate with respect to y, the x is constant. Now, do you see that if we integrated this with respect to x first, it would be a pain? Right? x cosine of x. How would you have to do that? Ultraviolet voodoo with a twist, right? x cosine x, you have, to, you have to do ultraviolet, you have to do integration by parts twice, and then you have to add the thing to the other side, and then divide by the coefficient. I call that ultraviolet voodoo with a twist, when you have to do ultraviolet voodoo, and then you have to move it back over to the other side and divide by that coefficient. That would be a pain, right? I did those. I did you enjoy those? <laughs> well, we won't have to do it here. So watch what happens when we integrate with respect to y first. Let's see. So x is constant. So we're integrating with respect to y. x is constant. So that x just stays there. It's a coefficient. Integral of cosine is sine of the same angle. But then you have to divide by the derivative of the angle with respect to y. And what's the derivative of the angle with respect to y? x. So we're just going to divide by x. And then we integrate 0 to 1. Our limits are 0 to 1. And so that x on the outside is going to vanish. So we can avoid our ultraviolet voodoo. You know, Isaiah loves ultraviolet voodoo. <coughs> All right, so we're plugging this in for the y. So we're going to end up with sine x um, minus sine of 0. Then our dx. And sine of 0 is 0, so that's just going to vanish. So now we just have to integrate the sine of x. That gives us minus cosine x, limits 0 and pi over 2. Plug in pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, and cosine of 0 is 1. So we have 0 minus 1. We end up with 1. Hmm. Yeah? Would you mind just walking me through the first changing? Yeah. So the from here to here. Yes. OK. So first, let's identify what's on the outside and just get that sort of cleaned up. So that stuff on the outside is right there. All right. And the blue is, we're going from the blue to the blue. So from the blue to the blue. All right, we're integrating with respect to y. So x is a constant with respect to y. So if you were going to integrate, say, 3 cosine of x, if you integrated that, the 3 just comes down, right? And the integral of cosine is positive sine. So that's what we're doing. So that x is just coming down. The integral of cosine is sine. And when you integrate a trig function, you first you get the same angle. But then you have the chain rule part. And the chain rule part says you have to divide by the derivative oh, of the right. angle. Yeah, yeah. So that x right there is the derivative of the angle with respect to y. It's kind of thing that, like, yeah. How one half so then you divide by 2, right? Whenever you have a linear substitution, you always have to divide by that coefficient. If you're integrating like e to the 5x, you get e to the 5x divided by 5. Integrate sine of 2x, you get minus cosine of 2x divided by 2. Right, exactly. So chain rule, reverse chain rule. I don't believe the means rule will work with this. Could you prove it? <laughs> Not right now. <laughs> it will have to wait. There's not enough space in the margins of this board. 
All right, so you guys try this one. <laughs> you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. We know it doesn't matter which order, because you have a rectangle. But maybe one, maybe one is easier to do first than the other, based on the one we just did. One direction may be easier. Lost a slide there, dang it. Whoa, what the heck? That thing jumped. Huh. I'm not sure why it jumped to there. That's all right, we'll try a harder one. Then the other two will seem really easy. I was just looking at that thinking, wait, shouldn't I have done two other examples first? At least. Yeah, we'll try that one first, though. Do a hard one, and then we'll move backwards to easier. All right, so let's see if you have it set up right. So, Fubini's theorem says that when we have a rectangle, we can create an iterated integral from a double integral. So it's called a double integral when you have a region as the subscript on the double integral. So that's called a double integral. Right here, when I break it apart and I put limits for x and limits for y, then it's not called a double anymore. It's called an iterated at that point. As soon as you have limits on each individual one, it's no longer considered a double. It's considered a sequence of singles, essentially. OK, so we've got our crazy thing here. Now we have to decide what order we're going to integrate this in. And one of the things that we see right away is that if we were going to integrate this with uh, respect to x, y squared is a constant with respect to x. So if we integrate it with respect to x, we'd be dividing by y squared in that integral, which would make the coefficient out in front a little bit easier instead of having a y cubed. Now, do you remember how you would have integrated y cubed sine y back in Calc 2? Yeah, y cubed sine of y. U sub won't work there because the y on the inside, the derivative of y cubed is 3y squared, and it's not y squared on the inside, so u sub won't work. You had to do ultraviolet boogie, you had to do integration by parts. How many times? You'd have to do it a few. There was something that you learned called the tabular method, I think. Some people might have done the tabular method. If you have a coefficient that's higher than just a, a single power, usually you can do the tabular method take derivatives and integrals through this table, and then at the bottom you get the answer. Uh, maybe you didn't do it. <laughs> or maybe you just forgot. I don't know. But you would, there's something called the tabular method that would work for this. It's kind of a complicated integration by parts. All right, we don't want to deal with that, though. So if we, if we do divide by the y squared, that would definitely, that would definitely help. Uh, so let's integrate with respect to x first. So x is going 0 to 2, so we have to put the x limits there. y is going 0 to root pi halves. So put that up top on the outside. OK, so integrating with respect to x. The outer integral is just coming along for the ride right now. Integrating this with respect to x, y is constant, so that y, square, that y cubed just comes down. And then the integral of sine is minus cosine of the same angle. But then you have to divide by the derivative of the angle with respect to x. So that's y squared. So we're going to divide by y squared. And then our x limits are 0 to 2. And then our outside differential is dy. So that simplifies to the 
following. We'll just cancel out, be left with a single y out in front, and then cosine of x, y squared, dy, 0 to 2. All right. So let's plug in now. We, we integrated with respect to x, so those numbers, those limits are for x. So that's going to give us the fundamental theorem of calculus piece of this. Plugging in x equals 2 means that we're going to have minus y cosine of 2y squared. And then minus a minus, so that'll be plus. Plugging in 0 for x, cosine of 0 is 1. Uh, so we end up with just y. Dy. So we end up with that. <clears throat> All right. We can definitely break this apart and do it into do it in two pieces. Move this down a little bit. So the y part integrates really easily. And how do we integrate the first part? There we're going to use sub. Substitution is going to work great there. Right. Everybody agree with that? <clears throat> okay, so let's separate it. And when we separate it, the second, let's do the y part first. Let's just put that out in front. So y dy, 0 to square root of pi halves. All right, and then the other part. So minus, and I'm going to rewrite it a little bit. It helps to may help. What's the derivative of the inside there? It's 4y. It's four y, okay? So what I'm going to do is this. Is that okay with everybody? So I just divided by 4, put that out in front. Right? 4 divided by 4 is 1. That brings us right back to where we were. But now I see the derivative of 2y squared right in front as a coefficient. So when you do your substitution, if you, if you do this, many of you might not even have to write. Some of you love to write everything down. So you probably will say, let u equal what? What would u equal here? 2y squared. 2y squared. Yeah, so we're going to let u equal that. And then du is 4y dy. So right here, this, is, this, this part right there is the du. So we're integrating cosine of u with respect to u. So you can just cut to the chase. You don't even have to write down your let statement if you don't want. All right, so first part, we get 1 half y squared. That's going to go 0 to root pi over 2 minus 1 fourth. And so the only thing we have to worry about is integrating cosine. And there's u, integral of cosine of sine. So that's going to be sine of u. And u is 2y squared. We're almost there. So we have one half out in front. We're going to plug in y squared, plug in the constants to y squared, so we get pi over 2. Minus 1 fourth. And then we're going to have sine of pi minus sine of 0. Sine of pi and sine of 0 are both 0. So that and that are going away. And our final answer is pi. Uh, um, pi over 4, thank you. Yes, pi over 4. So that's a hard one. That's definitely a hard one. And somehow my pen jumped over a slide, so let's go back and do a couple of easier ones. But first off, is there a piece in there that you want to ask about? Is there any step that... All right, let's do a couple of easier ones. I don't even know how my pen jumped that far. All right, so let's do this one. I'll do this one just to remind you there's a really important 
a couple of important inverse trig functions that show up in some of these. So you'll have to remember your sort of basic derivatives for like inverse tangent of x. Remember the derivative of that is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Um, inverse sine, anyone remember that one? Uh, 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. So those are the two most common ones. Inverse secant, sometimes you'll see maybe. That has the absolute value of x on the outside and then x squared minus 1 on the inside. How, if you can't remember how to differentiate inverse sine of x, how do you do it? Side note, because it's such an important construction that I feel like I should show, emphasize it. So if somebody says, if you are told that y is equal, let's put it up here. If you're told that y is uh, equal to inverse sine of x, that's a function, so you should be able to differentiate it. How would you do it if you don't remember that it's 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared? x equals sine y. So we're going to take the sine of both sides, and then we're going to... So this is what we just did, actually, a, a little a few sections back. The function y is buried... y is buried inside a sine, so it's not given explicitly here. So it's implicit. This is an implicit. y is an implicit function of x, so we use implicit differentiation. So this would be cosine of y times dy dx equals 1 if you differentiate both sides with respect to x. So then that tells us that dy dx is equal to 1 over cosine of y. We're trying to find the derivative with respect to x, so we should end up with x's, not y's. So we come back up here. And usually the way you're taught in Calc 2 normally is to build a triangle. Right there, you could also use the Pythagorean theorem. Typically we would say, hey, build a triangle that demonstrates that relationship. And if you build a triangle that shows you that relationship, let's put it right here, x is equal to sine of y. So we're going to say, oh, this angle is y. And sine of y is opposite over hypotenuse. So there's the triangle that demonstrates the relationship. That forces this side to be the square root of 1 minus x squared. So cosine of y is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's 1 over 1 minus x squared and square root. I think I'll just memorize it. <laughs> <laughs> that process is important, though. That process, is there a step in that process? That I, I remember that. I just, I mean, we're going to have so much to do anyway. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you'll, we'll, you'll be doing them enough that you will remember them, but just in case. That's a good, it's just a good exercise in how you use implicit differentiation to find the derivative of a pretty simple function. Okay, so that said, this is integrated pretty easily on the inside now that we know the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared is arctan. So we have y, y is constant with respect to x, so that's y arctan x. X's are going from 0 to 1. So let's leave this integral alone for now. Y is just going to sit there. We've got to plug in the X's. We have arctan of 1 minus arctan of 0. And arctan of 1, so pi over 4. The inverse tangent function lives on the right side of the unit circle. And we're saying, what's the angle on the right side of the unit circle with a tangent value of 1? Pi over 4. And the next one is saying, angle on the right with a tangent value of 0. The angle on the right with a tangent value of 0 is 0. <coughs> so we integrate y. We get y squared over 2. Pi over 4 comes out in front. y squared over 2, 0 and 1. So we get pi over 8. That's our final answer. Pi over 8. Hmm. 
You guys try number 20. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Is that far enough? Or? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Number 20. You should find with this one that it doesn't really matter which order you do it in. With the, the x's and the y's are separated. It's not like you have an x times y or something. So well, in this case, it's not going to matter. You might want to get rid of that square root first, because you know what it integrates to. But it won't matter. So everyone kind of get that set up. It's pretty straightforward up to that point. And I think going with respect to x makes the most sense first, because you get rid of the square root, makes it look a little simpler. And when we do that, we get the arc, uh, arc sine function. So this is going to be y times inverse sine of x from half to root 3 over 2. Then we substitute in, so the outer integral is just coming along for the ride, and the y is coming along for the ride. All right, so inverse tan, excuse me, inverse sine of root 3 over 2, <coughs> inverse sine lives on the right side of the circle, just like inverse tangent. Remember, inverse cosine is on top. <coughs> so inverse sine says angle on the right with a sine value of root 3 over 2. Angle on the right with a sine value of root 3 over 2, pi over 3. And then plugging in 1 half, angle on the right with a sine value of 1 half, we have the less steep terminal ray on a 12 sector circle. That's pi over, pi over 6. All right, so constant, we have pi over 3 minus pi over 6, which is pi over 6. That can come out to the front. <clears throat> Integrating y, we get y squared over 2. 1 to 2. So we get pi over 12 multiplied by 4 minus 1. So we end up with pi over 4. Set it up first, and we'll plow through the mechanics of it. <clears throat> the only thing at this point when you're setting it up, when you're dealing with the rectangle, is just making sure that your differential is lined up with the correct integral. So you've got the right limits. If x is on the inside, your x limits are on the inside. If x is on the outside, your x limits are on the outside.
preference to get rid of the y first. Substitution becomes a little easier if it's done last to get rid of the y first. Because x sine x squared is all constant with respect to y. Let's do that. Let's do the let's get rid of the y. So we're going to do the y first and then the x. See what to do. If we're going to integrate <coughs> with respect to y, what do we get? Sine x squared over 2y squared. Y squared. Well, what about this? Did you say sine x squared? Yeah, it said x sine x squared. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I didn't quite hear it all. So the, the x sine x squared is just a constant. So that's just going to sit in front. We integrate y, y and get y squared over 2. So it's y squared over 2 times that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It doesn't take long before you start to get into good habits. <coughs> We're plugging that in for y, those constants. So we're going to end up with 1 half x sine x dx. Sine x squared, sorry. All right. So to use the method of intuitive substitution, the derivative of x squared is 2x. So ideally, I would have this. So to use intuitive substitution, I want to rewrite the coefficient so that it matches the derivative there. But what does that mean my coefficient out in front has to be? One fourth, right? So to do it streamlined, you want to set it up like that. And then your u is right there. And your du is the other part, including the dx. It's all part of du. I shouldn't write it twice, though. The combo of those is du. All right, so we have sine u du. And that integrates. Integral of sine is minus cosine. So we're going to have minus 1 fourth cosine of x squared, 0 to root pi over 2. So that's minus 1 fourth times cosine of pi over 2, 0. Oops. 0 minus cosine of 0. We end up with a fourth. One uh, good habit to get into is taking a look back at your function. And in this case, it's kind of complicated because you can't really tell, maybe looking at that rectangle. Maybe you can't tell, obviously, in this case, because it's got a sine function, whether it goes below the xy plane or whether it's all above the xy plane. If it's all above the xy plane, your answer should be positive. Now, just like in Calc 1, there were times after you did the integral of functions that sat above the x-axis, then you let them dive below the x-axis, and you found something called the sine area, or the net area where your integral would take the upper area minus the lower area thing, right? So if you integrated the sine function from 0 to pi, you'd get 0, right? If you wanted the area, yeah, depending on what the question asks. If you just did a straight integral of sine x from 0 to pi, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, 0 to 2 pi. I'm not sure why <laughs> 0 to pi. 0 to 2 pi, you get minus cosine x. 
there to there. So you have minus cosine of, of 2 pi is 1 minus cosine of 0. And you end up with 0. Right? So signed area, meaning upper area minus lower area. Same thing happens with the surface. If your surface goes below the xy plane, you're going to have an upper volume and a lower volume. And the straight integral across is going to do the upper volume minus the lower volume. So you get the sine volume or net volume. That's what they often will call it. All right. Let's, why don't we take a break? Let's do our 10 minutes now. Um, and if you want to work on this problem during the break, you can. I'll leave it right there for your pleasure. Levi suggested integrating with respect to x first. Does everybody see why that's a good idea? Because yeah. partial of xy with respect to x is y, and we'll divide by it. All right, cool. So let's turn our double into an iterated. And so we're going to do x first, and then y. x goes 0 to 1, y goes 0 to pi over 3. All right, so there's our iterated integral. And if we integrate with respect to x first, the outside is what it is. And we're holding y constant, so we end up with sine of xy. And let's put this out in front just to make sure it's clear. And then those limits are 0 to 1, and we have the y limits. Does that look OK? We integrate with respect to x, we end up dividing by y, which will cancel that y in front. <clears throat> then we substitute those values in for x. So we're going to end up with sine of y. And then when we plug in 0, we get sine of 0, sine of 0 is 0. So sine of y minus 0 is sine of y. Integrate sine of y, we get minus cosine of y. 0 to pi over 3. So we get minus. What's cosine of pi over 3? 1 half minus cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So we end up with positive 1 half. the other ones seem so easy now. All right, so the last thing in this section uh, is average value of a function. And just like in Calc 1 where you found the average value, in Calc 1 you had a curve, and what you did was find the area, and you divided it by the base to get what the height should be, to get the average value. You did area divided by base to get height. The height was the average value. It was kind of one of those sand things. You shake it until it's level. That's the average value. Here, same idea. We're going to find the volume divided by the area of the base, and we'll get the average height that we need. So we're going to basically be finding the height of if the, if, the, if the region in the xy plane is a rectangle, then we're creating a rectangular box that has the exact same volume as the surface f. We're trying to find the average height. All right, so nothing too complicated here. Let's look at our, our region here. It's a 2 by 2, so the area of the region in the xy plane is just 4. Going from 0 to 2, 0 to 2, so the area is 4. And when we set up our integral here, again, it doesn't matter what order if we're dealing with a rectangle, which we are. And for this particular function, it's just a plane. It's linear, both x and y, which doesn't matter. 
We can go dx dy or do y dx. I'll go do y dx. So y is on the inside, x is on the out. Oh, and they're the same even, so it doesn't really, can't even tell. You could make a mistake and not even know. So integrating with respect to y, we're going to get 4y minus xy minus y squared over 2. 0 to 2 dx. Everybody okay with that integral? So now we're plugging those values in for y. The outer integral is still hanging on. Plug in y equals 0 and it's going to go away. So that's cool. We just have to plug in the 2. So we're going to get 8 minus 2x minus 2 dx. Now we have to integrate that with respect to x. So we'll end up with 6x and then minus x squared over 2, so that's going to be minus x squared. 0 to 2. 12 minus 4, so we end up with 8. Yeah. Just, sorry, isn't that the volume we're looking for the average height? Oh yeah, we're not totally done. We did the integral, so we're not done. So this is the, yeah, thank you. So then our average height, or our average value, so what do they, do they use f with a bar over it? So f bar is going to be 8 divided by 4, so the average height is 2. Yeah, thank you. Make sense? Yeah. So the double integral is finding the volume. We get the volume to be 8. The base of that volume has an area of 4. Divide that in to get the average height. Yes. They were. Yeah. I mean, they probably found them, in, they were proved using, <coughs> using integrals. Like, you can prove that the area of an ellipse is pi AD, or uh, you know, area of a circle. You can prove all that stuff with these. Yeah, yeah. Volume of an ellipsoid. Absolutely. <clears throat> all right. Let's, I'm trying to decide. If, Let's just take a look at what this is representing. This is a pretty easy one to visualize. This plane, what's the x-intercept for this plane? So the plane is 4 minus, did I say x? Yeah. Let's start with z. What's the z-intercept? So the, the surface here is z equals 4 minus x minus y. The z-intercept is 4. four. There. And then how about the x intercept? Four. How about the y intercept? Four. All right, so we have this plane, and they wanted us to just look on the region zero to two. So our domain is down here. And if we plug in two and two, we're definitely we're you know we're, we have this rectangle, this rect, or I guess it's called a square, the square domain. And if we go up to the surface, we've got this kind of thing going on. So we're finding. Yeah, I didn't draw that very well. <laughs> <laughs> we're finding the volume below the plane above that square. Everyone, how do I draw that? Try again. So the square is down here. Did I say it wasn't that hard to draw? So it's up there. And when that projects up, it should look more like that, I guess. <clears throat> All right, so we're finding the, the volume of that green region there. 
right? The volume below the plane that's above that square. A lot harder to draw than I would have thought. <laughs> I, need to, I just need to practice that. You could draw a Q and then, like just a literal Q, and then on the back side you would extend it out. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, you could do that. So the area is just the area beneath this. There's the surface right there. <clears throat> oh, except it's a, I see, I see what I'm doing wrong. It's got to go all the way to the ground, though, right? It's got to look more like this. More like that. Yes. There, there, there. <clears throat> more like that. Because the Z value at 2, 2 is 0. All right, so we're finding that volume. And when we do the average value, we're creating a you know, rectangular box that has the same volume. OK. 12, 13, uh, 12, 12, 13, 2. 13, 2. So it's pretty rare that you have a rectangle in the xy plane that you're integrating over. Quite frequently, you're going to have curved boundaries and so we need to know how to deal with that. So this theorem tells us how to do that in two different cases. So let me show you what the cases look like before you even write anything down with that theorem. Let's just analyze these two possibilities here. This is the important piece. So we're going to consider two different types of regions. This type of region here, all three of those are examples of what I would call vertically oriented regions vertically oriented in the sense that if you pick a vertical element here, you have the same upper curve and the same lower curve all the way through. So this is vertically oriented in the sense that a vertical element uh, can slide from left to right and catch the whole domain without any weird things happening. Like for example over here, if I drew a horizontal element, oops, the right curve is what it is here. But if I drew a horizontal element there, the right curve is different. If I drew a horizontal element here, the left curve is this red curve. But then up here, the left curve is the black curve. So that's not vertically oriented. Vertically oriented, if we draw our vertical elements, we have uniformity. The top curve is always the, whatever that is, h. And the lower curve is always g. So that's a vertically oriented region. And same there. Right here, it's really obvious. If you drew that, your left, your, your left curve is red, your right curve is black. Here, your left curve is black, your right curve is black. Here, your left curve is red, your right curve is red. Total pain. So if you were to do, if you were to integrate with a horizontal element here, You'd have to break it apart into three different pieces, or maybe even more. It would be a total mess. You would never even try. You would say, oh, this is vertically oriented. So we're going to do, a, we're going to use a vertical element there. So that said, then we have to decide, well, what does that mean in terms of our differential? How do we write our dA? And so if it's vertically oriented, we're going to write dy dx. Because when we integrate with respect to y on the inside, we're going to get an x function, and that x function is going to represent cross-sectional areas with respect to x. And then x on the outside is going to give us this, this interval. Right? x on the outside has to be numbers. We can't have functions on the outside. So if with our two integrals, you have to have numbers on the outer integral. If you have a letter as a limit of integration in the outer integral, you're going to end up with a function and not a number. And in the final answer, we want the volume beneath f on this region. So we should end up with a number. So it's OK to have functions in the inner limits, but not in the outer limits. Outer limits have to be constant. So that's a vertically oriented region. And then here is a horizontally oriented region. So with a horizontally oriented region, it's a horizontal element. It doesn't matter where you draw your horizontal element. You have a uniform left curve and a uniform right curve all the way through, no matter where you draw that horizontal element. Yes, you are horizontal. OK? Yeah? On the second one that is a vertical example, uh, just a question. If the left bound A was, for example, 0.5, 
zero, mm -hmm. would you still be able to use it vertically oriented, or would you have to separate it into two different intervals? If this was at zero? Yes. So over here? Yeah. So that it had this, this crossing point? Yes. Then we'd have to do two separate integrals. Okay. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. then the upper curve and the lower curve have switched. If we left it, what it would do would be to take this area minus that area, or the volume above this minus the volume, or, mm, yeah. It would take, well, not necessarily, it depends. It would, you'd have to do it in two separate intervals. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, you learn in calc, in calc that if you switch the, the, the limits, if you just switch them, your answer ends up being the same in magnitude, but the sign changes. Right. So if you were trying to find, like if you were looking for area, here upper curve minus lower curve will give the area of this, but then over here you'd have to change it and do upper curve minus lower curve to get the area. Otherwise it would give you minus one times the area. All right, so let's try. Let's try. All right, so evaluating intervals. So here our boundary is that. We need to draw it. If you don't draw it, you're going to have a hard time picturing what's going on. So both of those are lines, and we have x equals 0, which is the y-axis. <laughs> All right, so it's bounded by x equals 0. I'll put a red line there. So that's one of our boundaries. And then y equals 2x plus 1. That's a line with slope 2. Y-intercept of 1. further up. Um, so plug it in two. Let me make those a little smaller. I don't want to go totally off the page. One, two, three, four, five, one, two. All right. So plugging in zero, we get one. Plugging in two, we get five. All right. So there's a boundary. <laughs> that line right through those two points. And then the last one, <coughs> y-intercept of 5 and the slope is negative 2. So that's going to look pretty similar, except go the other way. So when x is 2, we're at 1. And 0, 5. Alright, so those are three intersecting curves, and the region, I guess I picked red here. I don't want red. Red, you can't even see the darn thing. So let's use a highlighter, or yellow. Yellow will work. All right, so our region, the only possibility is that little triangle right there. If they say that these three are the boundary curves, there's only one region that's trapped by those boundaries, and that's right there. It's the only region. All the other regions are unbounded. So that's got to be the region that we're integrating over. That has to be our domain. So then we have to decide, is that a vertically oriented region or a horizontally oriented region? So we imagine vertical elements. We imagine horizontal elements. And what should we settle on, vertical or horizontal? Vertical. Is that vertical element right there? It doesn't matter where I draw the vertical element in that region. The same curve is on top and the same curve is on bottom. But if you drew a horizontal element, that right boundary is going to change. So that's vertically oriented. <coughs> All right. So if it's vertically oriented, you draw your vertical element, and that tells us that we need the x. The, I remember it as it means the x's have to be on the outside. Because when I see that, I say there's a vertical element for all the x's. I can imagine this vertical element sliding from left to right from x equals 0 to x equals that intersection point. Right? So that tells me that x is going to be on the outside, y is going to be on the inside. Whatever it takes for you to remember which goes with what. But with a vertical element, x's are on the outside. All right, we certainly need that point of intersection right there. And what is that point of intersection? One three, exactly. So one comma three. All right. So then when we convert this to uh, an iterated integral, 
I said x's are on the outside, so x's are going to go 0 to 1. And on the inside, all right, here's, here's where we have to do some thinking. OK, so that vertical element is connecting two functions. Those are going to be our limits of integration here. All right, so the lower function right there is y equals 2x plus 1. So this function is y equals 2x plus 1. That's the lower function. And the upper function is y equals minus 2x plus 5. So lower function to upper function. So that's how we set it up. So with that vertical element, we've got to figure out the curve on top and the curve below. Curve above, per curve below. So does everybody agree that minus 2x plus 5 is the curve above the element? It's the top part of the element. And the bottom part of the element is touching the other one. Okay. So now, to evaluate this, the outer integral stays alone. Stays, comes along for the ride. We're integrating the inside with respect to y. So x is constant. So we get xy squared over 2. <laughs> Plugging those functions in for y. Zero to one. The x over two, let's just move that to the front here. Try to keep it as simple as possible. So we have y squared. So we square the top function. We get 4x squared minus 20x plus 25. And then we have to subtract off the square of the lower function. Let's do that in a different color. The lower function squared is going to be 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. And then that's dx. <clears throat> All right, so combining like terms, we see 4x squared and a minus 4x squared. Those disappear. And we're left with the integral from 0 to 1 of, all right, so let's left here. So we have minus 20x minus 4x. So that's minus 24x. So it's going to be minus 12x squared. And we multiply by x over 2 out in front. And then our constant, 25 minus 1, that's 24. Divided by 2 is 12, so 12x plus 12x. No, yes, plus 12x, not minus dx. And now we're back, count one. So this function, again, it's helpful if you can kind of conceptualize that function right there. That's a function of x. So what that's telling us is that for each of the x's between 0 and 1, if you plug in x between 0 and 1 here, you're going to get the air cross-sectional area below that surface. And so the surface is sitting above there, and you should imagine these slices of area for each of those elements. And that function is going to tell you that cross-sectional area. All right, calc 1, we're flying now. So x to the 3 over 3, so we get minus 4x cubed plus 6x squared, 0 to 1, that's t uh, 2. Minus 4 plus 6, 2. Cool. You guys try to set up that one. Set up here is key. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, these guys, in a minute, we're going to be, there's some regions that you can reverse and do it either way. They're both vertically, they could be vertically or horizontally oriented. And you'll have to switch the order of integration sometimes to make it easier, like we avoiding ultraviolet blue. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, you have to draw the region if you're going to be able to do that correctly. Definitely recommend drawing the region. Hey, Leo, what time is that study group meeting with uh, Michelle? Oh, um... Is it 1 to 3? trying to figure it all out. Is it 1 to 3 or is it 1.30 to 3.30? It's like 1.30 to 3.30. 1.30 to 3.30? And that's on Mondays and... It's on Tuesdays and Thursdays? Yeah, they're still figuring out their times and stuff. But Tuesday and Thursday. For sure. If anyone's interested in the Cal 3 study group, it's going to happen in the library Tuesdays, Thursdays, probably around 1.30 to 3.30. All right, so this is the region you should be getting. <clears throat> We're integrating over this triangle. So those three lines form one closed area. All the other possibilities are unbounded, so that's what we're integrating over. <clears throat> are you going to pick vertical or horizontal? To make it easiest, you could pick either. The easiest way is going to be vertical. You could pick horizontal, but you'd have to do it in two separate double integrals. Okay. But if you choose vertical, you're going to have one integral. And what goes on the outside that's vertically oriented? Dx. X is on the outside. Yeah. Does everyone see that the x limits are going to go from minus 1 to 1? So we have to ask ourselves, for what x's is there a vertical element here? So that red vertical element, right, it's going to slide from x equals negative 1 all the way through the region. Right, so it's going all the way across. So it starts at negative 1, and there's a vertical element all the way over to positive 1. <coughs> 
Now we have to figure out our curves, our upper and lower curve. The upper curve is y equals 2x plus 2. The lower curve here is y equals negative x minus 1. So negative x minus 1 and 2x plus 2. Okay with everyone? So the element, you're going to use your element and you're going to imagine it moving through the region and it's trapped between a lower curve and an upper curve. <coughs> it's kind of similar to the rectangle thing, except the rectangle thing, it was, if you had a vertical element here, it's just trapped between two constants. This curve, if you can think of that as a curve, say if that's y equals 2 and y equals negative 2. Right, that element's trapped between these two curves. They just happen to be constants. So for us, we've got a linear upper function and a linear lower function. <coughs> right, integrating with respect to y. y cubed over 3. Ugh. That's brutal. Let's get that. All right, so we have to cube that. So that's 2x plus 2 cubed. Let's put that one third all the way out in front so it's not to have too many sets of parentheses. Minus, minus x minus 1 cubed dx. Zoinks. <laughs> cubing, 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 cubing. To cube or not to cube. How about not? <laughs> I like that idea. So you know how to cube it. I don't want to do foiling twice, but you guys know how to do it, right? Yeah. All right, so cube it out, blah, 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 bunch of x's, <laughs> and you get the answer. <laughs> yes. And then you put a box around it. Can we answer the Excellent. Can we answer the <laughs> Dot, dot, dot. Yes. <laughs> Work. Answer. Work. I know how to do this. Answer. Yes. Clearly, not enough space. Clearly, the problem. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I know I hated that. I know I was looking through it. I was convinced to do that. These people in my department said, oh, it's going to be so much faster to grade if you just force them to. I just don't like that because some people write big, some people write small, some people write a lot, some people write a little. It's like give yourself enough. I, I kept asking for more stretch paper at the testing center, and she's like, "How much do you need?" And I was <laughs> like, "I'm taking a count three tests. Like, <laughs> I need like the whole ream of paper." How much okay. do you need? Okay. <laughs> the correct answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Yes, I need more paper. <clears throat> All right, so let's do one more of these guys. Let's draw the region here. So you've got to be really good at your college algebra. You've got to be able to draw lines and curves and things like that. <laughs> oh, yes. All right, so this region here, a nonlinear boundary, Stepping up. And then y equals 0. Oh, I didn't extend that far enough. y equals 0 is the x axis. I was thinking we were going with the y axis. All right, there. <coughs> that should be a 2. All right, so there is our region, there's only one region trapped by all three of those curves, and that region is this sector looking thing. We have to decide vertical or horizontal. Makes the most sense to do this horizontally. 
Then we have the same left curve for every horizontal element. We have the same right curve for every horizontal element. And what letter goes on the outside? dy, right? Because the y's are going to be coming from a constant interval here. There's an element, a horizontal element for all these y values. <clears throat> all right. Then we set up our integral. So we said y's are going to go on the outside. The y's are going from 0 to 1. It's not really to scale, but that's 1. Okay, so those are on the outside, so the x's are on the inside. Hmm. All right, here we have to be careful. So this right-hand curve is y equals 2 minus x. The left-hand curve is y equals square root x. All right. But we need to solve each of those for x because a left curve should be a function of y and a right curve should be a function of y. Upper and lower curves are functions of x's, left and right curves are functions of y. So we need to solve each of these. This is x equals y squared and this is x equals 2 minus y. So that is our tricky piece. That if this element on the inside is a dx, this has to be x equals something. And the upper limit has to be x equals something. So that is 2 minus y. Okay. Question already? <laughs> no question. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, you again? <laughs> I'm not seeing it. <laughs> uh, how do you choose the one that should be the upper and lower parts of the work? Uh, okay, so when we're doing, when we have a vertically oriented region, we go from lower curve to upper curve. If we have a horizontally oriented region, we go from left to right. Okay, so, yeah. Sure. Sorry, I didn't say she was Oh, <laughs> no. I'll put a hat up here. <laughs> Not a distraction at all. Great question. So left to right, lower to upper. Yep. Everyone see how we solve each of those for x? And because this differential is dx, if you had numeric limits, you would be saying, oh, yeah, y goes from 0 to y equals 1. So we have to do the same thing with our inner integral. It's just that we're going between two functions. It's got to be x equals and x equals. Yeah. I like questions. OK. So integrating that with respect to x, we get, now here's a shortcut. Let's make sure that you remember this shortcut, because it's super important. And when you start getting into these double integrals, it can really save you time. Is it clear to everyone that when you integrate a differential, you get the length of the interval. Is that clear? So if you're integrating a differential, you get the length of the interval, even if it's a function. So like if we had y and y squared, and I was integrating dx, so x went from y to y squared, this would still be y squared minus y. You still get the length of the interval. If you're integrating a differential, you get the length of the interval. So here, we're integrating with respect to x. There's no x. Right? We have a 12y as our integrand. We're integrating with respect to x. There's no x. So you could write 12xy from y squared to 2 minus y. But by now, in Calc 3, this concept should be very familiar to you, that when you integrate a differential, you get the length of the interval. So that's a shortcut that will help us expedite some of this busy work. <coughs> So the outer integral is still 0 to 1, but we still have the 12y. But then the dx part is going to integrate to the upper limit minus the lower limit. So that helps us a little bit. Some of the
those little things pay off. And there should be an equal sign there. All right, so that's going to equal 0 to 1. Foil that out, or whatever it's called, distribute. So we get 24y. Actually, let's put the 12 all the way on the outside. Let's not distribute that silly integer. OK, so y distributing, we get 2y minus y squared minus y cubed dy. <coughs> Integrate with respect to y. Zero to one. Plug it in zero, contributes nothing, so we just have to worry about the one. So we're gonna have one minus the third one minus the third minus the fourth. The common denominator of 12. So we're going to have 12 minus 4, which is 8, minus 3, which is 5. So it looks like we're going to end up with 5 twelfths times 12. circle a triangle. So we have a line of slope 1 and a line of slope minus 1. And then y equals 1. region. So this point over here is at 2. So that's, uh, where are we? That one. So it's 2 comma 1, right? <coughs> and that point is 0, 1. And that point is 1 comma 0. So there's our region. Horizontal or vertical? Horizontal. Horizontal. If you did it vertically, you could, but you're going to have to break it into two parts. <coughs> All right, so we have to identify the left and right boundary curves. Let's go with the, the right boundary curve first. That's the one with the y-intercept of minus 1. So that's going to be x, that one right there. Is going to be x equals y plus 1. And the other boundary curve, the one right there on the left, that's with the y-intercept of plus 1. Solving for x gives x equals 1 minus y.
Okay. So our double integral is going to equal the following iterated integral. We have horizontal. Y's are on the outside. X's are on the inside. We're going to have Y on the outside. So Y is going from 0 to 1. And we always want constants on the outside. And the inner integral, we're going to go left to right. So it's going to be 1 minus y over to 1 plus y. y squared dx dy. Does that look good? That set up any questions? No mysteries? So we're integrating the inside with respect to x. Is there an x in that integrand? No. So that means that we can do upper curve, or in this case, uh, the right curve, minus the lower curve. Or upper, maybe I'll say upper limit minus lower limit. Upper limit minus lower limit. The integral of a lonely differential is the length of the interval. <laughs> Combine like terms. 1 minus 1 is 0. We have 2y, so we end up with 2y cubed. Integrate that. We get 1 half y to the fourth. end up with one half. Mm. Good. No typos. No typos. All right, so that's the volume. Ready? Well, I was just wondering if this helps. How easy this was. The one we did at the ago was the uh, thing that we skipped. Yeah. That would be a lot easier to do it horizontally in two parts. In two parts, I, th I think you're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so that one where we did end up with the cubes right there, yeah, it looks like instead of integrating with respect to y, if we integrate it with respect to x first, it looks like, did you do it actually? No, I didn't. I, well, I did the, the stuff this guy, but I didn't do it. But. Yeah, you certainly could do this with two horizontal, you could do two regions horizontally. So if we did that, if we integrate it with respect to x first, then when we do the y's, then we're just going to be plugging in constants for the y's. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that looks like it's probably going to be faster to do two separate horizontals instead of one vertical where you get cubes. Should you do one of those? Sure. Do where, we do a, where we split it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. No problem. So if we wanted to split this here, so let's do it with a, we'll use a black horizontal there. <clears throat> so we have to figure out what each of these curves is with respect to x. This one is certainly an easy one, x equals 1. This one over here, we have to subtract the 2 and divide by 2. So we're going to get y minus, y minus 2 divided by 2, so 1 half y minus 1, I believe. Um, and then we're going to integrate like this. So we'll go, instead of dy dx, we're going to go dx dy. We still have a y squared. And the outer limit here, so the x's here are going from 0 to, it looks like 4. Is that the right? Yeah, that's 4, right? OK, so the x's are going to go 0 to 4 on the outside. The y's are or excuse me, the x's are on the inside. Those are going from where to where? 1 to that half y of minus 1. OK. So that's going to be the volume on the top. It's going to get a little messy, but that's all right. We're used to messy. So we're, that's the area of, oh, 
it's the same color. That's the area of this, or the uh, volume that's going to sit above that triangle. And then we have to do the lower one. Tell me if you're not sure on something. Uh, oh, did I do right to left? Oh, I did. Thank you, Herman. Yes, it's left to right. Or we would have ended up with minus 1 times the correct answer. Thank you. Yeah, left to right. And then for the other one, left to right, instead of 0 to 4, we're going from where to where? Is that minus 1 or is that minus 2? I can't even tell. So we plug in x equals 0 to uh, the one that's goes sloping down. So plug in 0 there, so it's minus 1. So it's minus 1 to 0. And then here, when we draw our horizontal element, we're going to have a different left curve. Our left curve is going to be x equals. Here's our left curve. Solve that for x. So we're going to get x equals minus y minus 1. <clears throat> so that's the left curve. So we start there, minus y minus 1. The right curve is 1 again. We still have the same integrand. And then we'll have dx dy. So we have that. That make sense? Say that again. Shouldn't it be dy dx? Uh, we're doing the, <coughs> the y's are going on the outside because we're, we're we have a horizontal element that's horizontal. So for each y, there's a horizontal element. So if we have a horizontal element, y is on the outside. And the way I remember that is I'm thinking of the horizontal element sliding through the region for y values, right? from y equals 0 to y equals whatever. Is it from negative 2 to 0? Uh, if, I, if that point's negative 2, it is. Um, I tested it in this line. I might have done it incorrectly. This, is this the line right here? Uh, so when we plug in 1 here, oh, it is minus 2. It's minus 2. Plug it in right there. Because that's the equation of this line. So we're trying to figure out we're going from here to here. So horizontal elements are going from minus 2 to 0. Yeah, thank you. Minus 2. Yeah. <clears throat> Crisscrosses. It's, it's starting to it's starting to get hard to read. All right, so that does look like it's probably easier to evaluate than the other one with the cubes. We will have to square that function, take the difference, plug in, same thing over there. But that's easier than the cubing, unless you're a fast cuber. How can you be a fast cuber? Square. The yeah, you could do that, but if you know Pascal's triangle well, oh, well yeah. you could use Pascal's triangle. If you're good with those coefficients, you could use Pascal's triangle. Some people are really fast at cubing polynomials with Pascal's triangle. Or you could guess. <laughs> or you could ask Siri, since Siri and Wolfram Alpha are buddies. If you ask Siri what you should dress up for, for Halloween, she says that I should dress up as the Fibonacci sequence, and she'll be my plus one, plus two, plus three. Like, really? Plus five? <laughs> You're so lucky. Yeah, yeah. she talks to Wolfram Alpha. That's the engine. Is it real? Yeah. They run Siri. Yeah, you can ask her to factor 6,422,322, and boom. It's <laughs> pretty cool. I don't know if she does symbolic integration, though. That's a good, I haven't tried. Got to try that. I know. That's amazing. All right, so use double integral to calculate the volume of the following region. So let's see if we can draw this. <laughs> oh, no. All right, so solid in the first octant bounded by the coordinate planes and that surface. So that surface we see is, if we look at our traces quickly, if we um, are looking in the first octant, if we let x be 0, we see a line. If we let y be 0, we see a, a parabola opening down. And if we let z be 0, we see a parabola. So we're going to have some parabolic wedge thing. Let's see if we can draw it. Let's see if we know how to draw a parabolic wedge thing. 
Egad. Why me? All right. <clears throat> so first, let's go with this left plane over here. So that's x. That's y. That's z. So this left plane over here, we're letting y be 0. So that's 1 minus x squared. So 1 minus x squared is going to look sort of like that. <clears throat> And then let's go to this plane over here, the back plane. So x is 0, and we have z equals 1 minus y. When y is 0, z is 1. So we're at that spot, so that's great. The slope is minus 1. So it's going to be something like that. <coughs> and then when we let z be 0, we have y equals, uh, uh, when z is 0, we get y equals 1 minus x squared. Did I say that right? When z is 0, we get y equals 1 minus x squared. So that's actually this right there. OK, that's not too crazy. All right, so we've got these two parabolic um, boundaries. Now, we need to figure out how, let me draw, let me write down these two equations, because that might be very helpful. So 1 minus x squared right there. This curve over here, where y was 0, was z equals 1 minus x squared. And then this one over here was z equals 1 minus y. <clears throat> OK, we need to figure out, we're trying to find volume. So we need to figure out what the upper surface is. So just like we did with curves, you had an upper curve and a lower curve. Now, the lower surface is the xy plane. And we need the upper surface to figure out what the volume between the xy plane and that surface is. OK. Any idea which one is the upper surface? y equals 1 minus x squared. OK, so this y equals 1 minus x squared, that's going to be a trough, right? That's going along here. It's going to be this parabolic trough, this direction. So this is just the curve, and this is a cylinder. Right? The, the, the y is missing. So that's a cylinder type of thing going that way. This 1 minus x squared is a cylinder thing going upward. So somehow we have to figure out how, which one's dominating. And the, the one on top here is, gonna be, is going to be acting like the upper surface. This is going to give us a lateral bound. So that one is coming across, and this is just telling us where to stop it. You know what I mean? So the one on the left is, is being extruded across like that. And then the one below is just sort of a lateral bound. That's like the region in the xy plane. So the re this is going to be our domain of integration right down there. And that will be our upper surface. Why is that the upper surface and not the C? Because that seems like it would be a cylinder as well. The, OK, so that is true. Good point. So now, if that thing comes forward this direction, is that what you're imagining? Yes. Tilted this way like a, like a wedge? Yeah. OK, that's coming this way. But it's not, um, yeah, it's not on top, though. How do I tell you that it's not on top? Making sense. Yeah. Um, let's see. How do we convince ourselves? Ask Siri. Yeah, yeah, let's ask Siri. Um, well, okay, think of it this way. Think of it this way. And actually, part of what I said is not necessarily the best way to interpret this. This is our surface right there. Right. That's our surface. Um, these are the projections of our surface. And when we're looking at the projections of our surface into the three coordinate planes, uh, I guess it's actually unnecessary. I was trying to go through the exercise of figuring out where they intersect. But I don't, actually don't need to do that because we actually know our surface. This is the thing that's on top. Right? That's the surface on top. We actually don't even have to picture it because 
the only part that's important is going to be the part that's down here in the xy plane. That's the region that it's on top of. Right, so that surface is sitting on top of a whole, of a, of, you know, it's, it's undulating on top of the xy plane. We need to know where it's chopping through the first octant. So we really only need to know where it's meeting the xy plane because the surface is, is going to sit on top of that. This is really what we need to do. So we only have to integrate the surface on top of that region. And what I was originally thinking was that we, if we could figure out how the, cur how the surface really looked in the first octant, it would help. But it actually doesn't matter how it looks. And so we've got this first octant, we've got this surface, and it chops through the xy plane. All we care about is where it chops through the xy plane. Because it's going to be sitting on top of the xy plane no matter what in that first octant, <clears throat> as long as it's positive valued. And as long as we're inside this red region, it's sitting on top. So we actually don't have to get any more precise than that. <clears throat> so the solid in the first octet, bounded by the coordinate planes, it's just sitting above here. It's a totally different question if I say, hey, this is a cylinder and that's a cylinder, where do they meet? That's a different question. And we don't really have to, act, act, we don't have to answer that question. Because you know, that surface is sitting above the xy plane. That's, that's it. Okay, and so I didn't really even need to draw these extra two traces. We really just need that trace right there. Because we know that the surface is sitting above it. All right, so then the volume, we integrate the surface, and we're integrating the surface on this region in the xy plane. So the more important thing is this region in the xy plane. And it said the first octant, which means x and y are both positive. And so the curve in the xy plane that's, that's pivotal to us is this. y equals 1 minus x squared. So that's our region in the xy plane. And let's go ahead and use a vertical element. We could use a horizontal, but then we'd have to solve for x, which would be a pain. We'd get a square root. We don't want to do that. So we're going to use a vertical element. So that means the x's are going to go from 0 to 1 and be on the outside. The y's are going from 0 to the upper curve, which is 1 minus x squared. So that would be our, that would be our setup. OK, so integrating with respect to y first, we're going to integrate 1 and get y, integrate that, get minus y squared over 2, integrate that and get minus x squared y. And that's 0 to 1 minus x squared dx. <clears throat> All right. We have to plug in that upper limit for y. So we're going to end up with 1 minus x squared minus 1 half times that squared, which is 1 minus 2x squared plus x to the fourth, minus x squared times that. So minus x squared plus x to the fourth dx. And that should, we should get some simplification there. We end up with, let's see, what are our x to the fourth? So we have a positive one half x to the fourth, I believe. And then, so we've used up that, we've used up that. <clears throat> and then the squareds, we have, I think, minus x squared. Because this right here is really a plus x squared. And that's minus x squared, so that cancels, and we're left with 1 minus x squared. And then our constant, I think a positive half, dx. And then we integrate that. So we end up with 1 tenth x to the fifth minus x cubed over 3 plus 1 half x. That's all 0 to 1. The 0 wipes everything out. We end up with a tenth minus a third plus a half, which at this stage of the day, it's 17. It's, 17. it's what? 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 17. <laughs> Would you guess? Four fifteenths? Yeah. Four fifteenths? Yeah, yeah, I can't think right now. Four fifteenths. I'll trust you. Yeah. Thirty common denominator? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the the let me just summarize on this one. I the, the faster, the more expedient way to think about this is we've got this surface here. And it said we want to integrate over the region in the first octet. So what I really should have said to myself was, let's just plug in z equals 0 and see where it is in the first octet. And we really don't need this bigger picture of it. This would have sufficed right there. Right. That's really all we should have done. A little extra mapping. All right. Is it Wednesday? Have a good weekend.